Looking to provide your school or organization with high quality audio products at affordable prices? Andreas Communications specializes in designing microphones, headsets, USB adapters, webcams, and more to ensure online reliable communication. Their EDU series of products are built to withstand the rigors of classroom usage. Andreas Communication partners with iTutor to provide an exclusive discount for Learning Can't Wait listeners of 40% off their noise-canceling headsets. Head to https colon forward slash forward slash andreacommunications.com forward slash iTutor forward slash today to access this limited offer. IPVO is making online learning simple for educators and students alike. Their affordable and lightweight document cameras let teachers simply plug and play to share anything. Homework, live demos, PowerPoints, videos, and more from anywhere. Compatible with any device, teachers can make the most of their document cameras with creative filters, time lapses, stop motion, and more through IPVO's free software, Visualizer. IPVO and iTutor have partnered to provide a 20% discount to all Learning Can't Wait listeners. Visit IPVO.com forward slash iTutor to upgrade your technology today. Welcome to the Learning Can't Wait podcast, an iTutor production. At iTutor, our vision is to ensure every child has access to education, regardless of circumstance. Each episode, we will be joined by pathfinders within and around the education space who are bringing about transformational change on behalf of deserving students. I am your host, Haley Spiravauer. Welcome back, everybody, to today's episode. It is a wonderful episode, a panel episode of the Learning Can't Wait podcast. I'm so excited today to introduce you to our guests. Our topic today is serving everyone, a closer look at community schools. And our guests are someone you may recognize from previous episodes, Luis Torres, principal of CS55 in the Bronx in New York. Welcome, Mr. Torres. How are you? I'm great. And I'm always excited to be on your podcast. I'm so glad you're back. I'm excited for today's episode. And our other guest, Lita Casper, who is the Coordinator of Community Partnerships for Rochester, Minnesota Schools. Welcome, Lita. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here with you both. I'm so happy to have you both here. I have to tell you, I often talk about how we got to where we are for the episode that we're about to record. And how we got to where we are is that Lita recently was promoted from a school-based position to a more global position in her community. And there was an article published about it. I read the article, reached out to Lita and said, I'd love to have you on. And then she said, I'd love to talk with other people when I come on. And who else to come on and talk about? community schools than Mr. Torres. So thank you both for joining here today. I'm so excited to have you. How about we dive right in? Perfect. I'm ready. (laughs) You're obviously both leaders in community schools, but I want to know how you got to where you are. So Lita, why don't you start for us? How did you get to the position that you're in today, serving the entirety of Rochester, Minnesota, as the coordinator of community partnerships? I guess I'll go back a little bit. So I started my career teaching in New York City. I taught at a school called CS57. It was Community School 57. And it was it was just an interesting concept to me, learning about community schools from that position. I didn't quite understand it at the time. After serving two years in that incredible school, I was just super interested in people, culture, learning. What is culture? What is human? And I found myself teaching in a rural community in Alaska. It was a Yupik community, very small, but it was uh, the essence of a community school. And so, you know, we had grandparents who came to lunch every day. We had dental clinics. We had vaccine clinics. Everything happened at the hub, which was the school. So that that concept, while it wasn't a community school there, it was definitely a community school. And moved to Rochester, Minnesota, and was a fourth grade teacher, then an instructional coach, and a position came open when the grant cycle opened in 2016, and I was the community school coordinator there, and it was just the most interesting 
an exciting opportunity for me because of the experience I had had in education across the country. It's sort of that whole concept of it takes a village. And so I had done that role for about six years and recently position came open for this uh, coordinator of community partnerships to support all of community schools in Rochester and uh, among other things, but uh, just really part of my my deeply rooted <laughs> belief in what education can and should be. I love that. I see obvious trajectory. A lot of times when I talk to guests on the podcast, they're talking about the, the through lines in their career. You know, you began your career as a teacher in a community school and have continued to serve in community schools throughout. So excited to dive deep into that in a little bit. Mr. Torres, now uh, on to you. Talk to us a little bit about how you've come to, you're going on your 18th year now leading a community school. Talk to us about your path to community schools, please. Yeah, so I've been a, a principal for 18 plus years. And I've been doing community school work for at least 23 years. I, I was under the leadership of uh, Superintendent Dr. Betty Rosa, who is now the Commissioner of Education in New York State. And I saw her putting computers in every single home. She was trying to end the digital divide when computers first came out. And from there on, I said, this is the type of work we need to be doing. We need to be addressing those inequities that exist in our communities. And if we have to be the change agents that do that, then we need to do it. And what better place than in schools? You know, schools can become the equalizers in a lot of our communities that lack resources. So at our school, we have a hospital in the school with a nurse, dentist, psychologist, ophthalmologist, full-time on staff. We have aeroponic farms where we grow vegetables all year long. We have a soccer stadium we just built. Uh, we have an uh, upgraded auditorium, a $2 million upgrade of the auditorium. We're moving our cafeteria to the first floor to provide our students with adequate uh, food and, and, and services from a, a brand new space. So as an educator, I, I fight to make sure that we address those inequities. I always tell people, you know, education is a sixth priority for a lot of our families. Food, shelter, safety, health, and access to technology come first. And if we don't address those five basic needs, we never get to truly educate our children. You know, I, um, recently I went on social media and I told people, if we don't feed the children, they'll eat the teachers. And that's a reality, right? You know, if you don't feed our children, if, if they're not well fed, it's hard for them to focus on education. And what happens is when they're in the classrooms, they're, they're, they're the ones that are going to be disrupting the classrooms. And it's not because they want to be disruptors. It's just because they're hungry. So as a, a leader and as an educator of a community school and a author of a book about this work, you know, I, my hope is to be able to become a model for schools across the country because this is the type of work that needs to be happening in our in our communities. And without this work, we can't truly educate our children. I'm so glad you named your book because obviously we're going to talk about that as well during our time together today. Um, I'll name it here. I'll name it again later. It's called The Six Priorities, How to Find the Resources Your School Community Needs. And it was published by ASCD very recently. Had a chance to read it. It's a quick read. But I want to stop us for a second and ground us in a, de a definition because I will be honest, like Lita, like, like Lita, I, I really didn't know what community schools were when I was teaching in them. Obviously, I worked in one for two years. I have been reading about them throughout my career in education, but I went to NEA's website and it says that a community school is a public school that provides services and support that fit, that fit each neighborhood's needs, created and run by the people who know our children best, all working together. So how does that definition fit with your own perspective over in Rochester, Minnesota? Like, talk to me about, you know, in New York City, community schools also have a very specific definition, which I'll get to in a second. But in Rochester, Minnesota, how does that definition fit with the implementation of the community schools model? The, the piece that I latched onto that you had mentioned was the focus on the needs and priorities, the needs, assets, priorities of our community. I think historically in public education, we 
have done things to communities and to our schools, to our students, to our families, rather than with them. And that's one of the biggest pieces to me that is the foundation of what a community school is, is it is, we are building this together. We are focusing on the needs and assets and priorities of our communities together. And so I think it's just, it, that's the foundation of what a community school is. And without having that needs assessment really done early on, I think it's difficult to, to prioritize the needs of the school and the community. And, and so I, I would agree with that definition. When people ask me, I say it's a strategy for organizing school and community around student success. I like and that I as well. I think that it's like a framework the way you're naming it. It is a frame. Yeah, it is a framework. Yeah. Yeah, and I wanted to share that, you know, for me, it's what I call community matching, which is a process in which you look at the resources the school has and you match it with the needs of the community. And wherever there are gaps, the school has to figure out how to fill those gaps, right? So for us, it was the need for medical support because there was no real hospital in the community. So we decided to bring a hospital into the school. For us, you know, the food pantry, because we found a lot of families that didn't have access to healthy food. So we provided through the food pantry. So it's basically you look at all the resources you have in your school, you look at the needs of the community, and then you start to match it. And then you fill what I call are the gaps. And then you and you also identify those things that you need over those things that you want. Right. Because everybody wants things. They want a beautiful school. But is it that what you really need right now? You know, you might need a food pantry more than a than a nice paint on your uh, cafeteria or something, you know. So it's, it's really identifying those needs versus wants and then also filling those gaps as you match the resources. You know, what I what I see a lot of in schools is they continue to hold on to things, even though they're not you know, satisfying a need in their community. You know, so you have bilingual classes for Spanish speaking students, but yet your community is now African. Right. So you have to you have to shift the resources within your school to match the needs of those com- the communities that surround the schools. So, you know, obviously these are I appreciate that emphasis on needs versus wants um, because schools have both. They have lots of needs and lots of wants. And what I'm questioning right now is how do you become a community school where you are? Like, why can't, uh, one of the things I said recently to, to some of my team members, why can't every school be a community school? So mm-hmm. what about in Rochester? Is, can every school be a community school? Why, what's stopping this and what allows for Rochester, Minnesota to have community schools? Well, the way that our schools, uh, Again, it, it has to be it has to be something that's fostered from the school within, right? And so we don't want to just make schools community schools. We want to make make sure that the that the opportunity is ripe in the building. That that's something that is part of that's going to be a part of the culture. Because you're right, any school really could be a community school. What it takes is a financial commitment of in in our case, we ask for one FTE, so one full time person who's uh, designated as the, commu- we call it community school site facilitator. So one person who's, or, who's, who's doing this, doing the, the uh, comprehensive needs assessment, and then, you know, just really building strong relationships with families, with staff, with communities, with, with families, with community partners, um, and fostering all of that to be able to just like Mr. Torres said, to match, you know, the, the needs and the priorities of, of, of the school. So really it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty minimal cost. It's one, it's one position. And I think I'm looking at a a statistic here. I think the return on investment is typically between three and $15 per dollar invested in community schools. One of the things that is really, is really powerful about it, about the community school site facilitators that they are engaging with all of these stakeholders. And so they're leveraging existing community resources, leveraging funds to, you know, to, to work together to whatever need is determined. I can give some examples of that. And I'm sure Mr. Torres could as well. Um, yeah, there's some really let's, fun. Let's talk about an example. Let's make it real for folks. I know you ran in Rochester, a really interesting initiative to help some of your students become certified drivers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of, it's, 
Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Please jump okay. in. So a little different than New York City, potentially, because you've got public transportation. But here, right, we're living in a place where we don't have extensive public transportation. And so one of the one of a huge need is for students to be able to get their license. Well, if a child can get their license then they have access to their future post-secondary options, going to work, right, things like that. So so that's that's a need. We learned early on that roughly a third of our uh, students who didn't have licenses were driving around periodically without a license. But what happens when you're caught without a license? You're entering the criminal justice system. So not only are we are we creating this driver's education program within the school system, we're creating a safer community, but we're also, you know, creating opportunities for kids to have post-secondary options. And we're keeping people out of the criminal justice system because once you get in there, it's difficult to get out. We have, with this particular partnership, I didn't start it, a community school facilitator at uh, John Marshall started it along with another person in our school district. And they were able to secure funding through a grant, so a large scale grant. They were able to get police officers to assist students in getting their 50 hours of mentorship behind the wheel hours, right? That if you don't have a vehicle at home, difficult to get those hours. And yeah, so we got the funding from the Bridge Collaborative. We have the police officers involved. Oh, we got vehicles donated from our county. They were no longer useful for the county. And so the, the county donated those three vehicles to our schools. So each of our three high schools has its own vehicle. And so really like it just, this is to me, that's a really, op, that's a really good example of our entire system, our entire community working together to support kids and families and opportunities and access. And like I said, the Bridge Collaborative grant had funded um, had funded the driver's ed program. So it was a very low cost to the family, which normally is over $500. And we have lots of students who otherwise would not have access to getting a driver's license and access to their future without this, without this program. Yeah, and I, I wanted to say that, um, you know, for my first 12 years, I functioned as a community school, even though I wasn't labeled a community school. A lot of it is the leadership of your school, right? If the leader in your building sees the importance of community within the building and is willing to match the resources with the needs of the community, then the school to me is a community school, even if it's unofficial. <laughs> you have to have people in the building who believe in it, right? You have to, I tell people, you can't be a community school without having the community. You know, even the way we hire people in our school, we have about, I would say, 12 former students that now work in the school building. We have two former students who are now teachers in the school. We have about 10 school aides and paras that are former students. So, you know, a lot of the things that we were doing as a school would make us a community school. And, and like Alita was saying, you have to have those people in your building who are invested in this work. And, and if you need to commit a staff member, um, we had a staff member in our building, our parent coordinator served almost like a community school director. And she was like serving to get the partners and doing all of that work. And then with my leadership style, which is all about community, we were able to start doing this work way before being officially, we were public school 55 for a while. And then we became CS 55 eventually because there was no way you could deny the work that was happening in my building and not give us that title. And we didn't have the additional funding, but we were doing so much with the community and we had so many uh, established partners that at some point the Department of Education had to identify us as a community school. There is a process in New York to, to become a community school, but wh whether we had to follow the process or not, did it matter? We were, we were officially community school from the moment I walked into that building. And you can feel it. I, I will say having taught in your school, Mr. Torres, and also having visited within the past month, you can feel that. You know, I want to call out that New York City had a really concerted effort in 2016 to increase the number of community schools in the city. And RAND actually did an impact study called Illustrating the Promise of Community Schools, an assessment of the impact on New York City community schools initiative. 
And what they found was, and I'm sure this resonates with you, and, and it's probably why both you two are such champions of community schools, but graduation uh, rates increased in community schools as compared to non-community schools. Chronic absenteeism was significantly lower. Student achievement was significantly higher. And disciplinary incidents were significantly less frequent in comparison in elementary and middle schools. And so those are pretty astounding results. And pro and again, name why there's such a movement, particularly in New York City, but obviously in other places around the country, to have more community schools. You know, Mr. Torres, you are a huge champion of the community school movement. You are a very, uh, and our first episode was called Hustle Culture. You speak really openly about hustling on behalf of your students and your community in order to form these partnerships. What does it really take to establish these external partnerships on behalf of the community that you serve? Well, I think that the, the most important trait or skill that a leader should have is they have to be humble and not afraid to beg. You have to be a beggar sometimes and, and a hustler um, and, because you're not begging and hustling for yourself. You are asking for other people. You're asking for your children. And I think when I speak to leaders and they're like, oh, you know, I really didn't want to ask for that because, you know, I don't want them to, to say why I keep getting funding for computers every year. No, you ask them every year until they stop giving you computers because the one day that they, the one year they don't give it to you, you're going to regret it, right? So you have to be willing to ask people for things. Sadly, a lot of schools don't move forward because the leaders are afraid to ask for things. Uh, they're afraid to go out to meetings or events, uh, networking events to get those resources, or they just don't see it as an important part of their leadership style. But for me, I make it a point to try to create as many partnerships as possible, strategic partnerships, because you never know when that well is going to dry out. Um, in 2011, I was named Outstanding Educator for the Country, and that same year, they were talking about shutting down my school. The reason why is because whenever you show success, they take away the funding to help you to be successful. So you have to figure out how to sustain whether you're successful or not, because sometimes the systems are created to keep you from succeeding. So you have to you have to be willing to go out there begging and hustle for anything you can get and, and not be afraid because it's not for you. You're not asking for anything for yourself. You're doing it for your children. And I think that once leaders understand that, um, they're willing to have those conversations. They're willing to ask people for money. They're willing to ask whatever it needs to be done. They're willing to get it. And I think that, you know, we, we have to do it at the end of the day because our children can't. So we can and let's do it. I, I, I just have to uh, I just have to have to connect with what you just said Mr. Torres the hustle culture when I I actually listened to to your episode and I I told Haley that that was that's I mean, it's just completely how I have always described that role as a community school facilitator is right is you're just constantly hustling people would say what's your job and I'd say well I feel like I'm kind of a full-time hustler and I think you make a really good point though I mean that's kind of a joke but I think you make a really good point is sometimes schools just have to ask and there are resources and there are people and there are people who want to support the work that we're doing because it's good work and it's work for kids and for families and for our community, right? And so it makes sense that people would want to support it, but oftentimes they just need an ask. And I'll give you one example. So what, when I was in my first year, first two years as community school site facilitator, we had created this large scale mural. It was a thousand square foot mural. It was, it was created by the students. It was painted by the students with the facilitation of a, of a, of an artist, obviously the mural included pe like the students that we actually serve, right? Like this is an auth authentic example of based on our needs assessment, inclusive of our students and our families and our community. Right. And we got to the end of it toward the end of the, of the project. It was a roughly two year project and the, the mural cost roughly 60 to $70,000 in the end, which was more than I had anticipated actually. And I got to the end and I had $10,000 left. I had written every little $3,000 grant that I could because nobody wants to fund the public arts. And, <laughs> and I got to the, got to the last $10,000 and I said, 
I, I, I said to uh, my husband, I'm going to get fired. I don't know what I'm going to do. Where am I going to find $10,000? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to call our Rochester area foundation, which is a local foundation. And I'm going to talk to talk to them. And she, all she did for me was she said, you know what, Lita, there is, there's money in this community. There's resources in this community. You're going to look at it in three ways. You're going to look at it in large grants. You're going to look at it in fundraisers and you're going to look at personal donations. That's how you're going to get that money. She said, go out and ask. And literally in one week's time, I had that $10,000. So it just, I think you're right. I mean, it just, you have to ask, you have to be willing to make the case and it's not, it's important because it serves the students in the community. And now we have kids who walk by that mural and they say, wow, that there I am, I'm on that mural. And it's not them, but it's a kid who looks just like them. And so that's, that's the power of, of, of community. Uh, I have the chills from that story. And I love, I mean, I really do love the connection here. You two have never met before. You're doing work in totally different parts of the country. And it speaks to the heart of the efforts that you have and the initiatives you push forward. Lita, talk to us a little bit about the hustling you're doing at the state capitol uh, tomorrow. On your birthday, happy early birthday, on your birthday. So talk to us a little bit about the that type of hustle and why, how that differs yeah. from the purpose it serves. Yeah. Well, in this case, right now, our uh, the state of Minnesota is in really, uh, we have we got a budget surplus and we have um, two bills that will, that are ideally going to fund uh, community schools and our community schools efforts. And actually, so we've historically gotten small grants, two-year, three-year grants where we could start the program, but then there's not sustainable funding. And so part of this bill is creating that sustainable funding source, which is really, I mean, we can all agree that if we if 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 we believe that this work is worth doing, then we need to fund it. And so um, tomorrow we have a. I'm bringing actually a student who had been in our driver's education program and her mother, and they are sharing how that has impacted their life, how it's impacted her future, how it's impacted her post secondary opportunities, and um, looking really looking forward to it. Bring, we're bringing a couple of our school site facilitators as well. And so we just have a full list of legislators and senators that we're going to visit and uh, looking forward to the opportunity to hustle. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that sounds incredible. And I wish you the best of luck at that. And I can't wait to hear how it goes. Mr. Torres, now a question for you. So we alluded to this book, you already named the six principles, priority one being food, or excuse me, priorities, food, then shelter, then safety, then health and technology access, then education. These are the chapters of your book. For people that are like, oh, he wrote a book. I'm curious. What would you say it's about and why should someone read it? So it's it's the hustler's handbook, I call it, right? If, if, if you need to get some resources for your school, you pick up this book. It's so easy to read. I mean, it literally will do the work for you. In it, we go through the community matching process. I talk a little bit of how to identify needs over wants. The book is just an easy book to use. I'm not just saying it because I wrote it. I'm saying it because this is what people are telling me. You know, people are writing me, talking about how excited they are about utilizing the skills that they have acquired. And, you know, it's, it's just something that I'm proud of because for a long time, People would ask me, you know, how do you get so many resources? How do you get $50 million for this? How do you do all these different things? You know, basically the book tells you how to do it. And, and, and what I love about the book is that it doesn't matter what school you are in. It doesn't matter where you are. If you have an idea of a project or something you want to do for your school community, you just need to pick it up. If you're someone who doesn't know what a community school is, just got to pick up the book. And it'll give you some idea of what a community school is. And if you're a new principal and you want to make a splash in your school and you want to do something nice for your students, the book has a lot of great ideas. I also give you partnerships you can establish, uh, grants you can apply for. It's, it's just a one-stop shop for hustlers. And I keep using that word, but that's the reality of it. And it, it just basically makes it so much easy for you. You know, you just put it in your pocket. Um, I think you could probably read the book in a couple of days. It doesn't take too long to read it, but you'll be going back to the book every time you have an idea because, you know, I address those basic needs that our families struggle with. And if you want to, you know, figure out how to address food, 
you know, the first chapter talks all about how to address food in your community and, and how to how to do that work. So I'm just proud of the book. Um, I'm excited about what the book is going to do for a lot of people. And I'm already starting to see, you know, the fruits of the labor because people have been writing me about, you know, things that they're doing for their school now as a result of the work. So I'm excited. And, uh, you know, I hope to continue to push it. Nobody's going to become a millionaire off a book. So that's not it. Right. Unless you're writing a Harry Potter book. Right. You're not going to make money off the book. So it's not about the money. It's about the purpose and, and the work that needs to happen. It makes my life easier when more and more schools are doing this work. So. Well, and it makes children's lives better. Again, like going back to this question I keep asking, and maybe that should be the title of this episode, is why isn't every school a community school? I really wanted to to highlight both of you and the work you're doing in your communities because I'm so incredibly inspired by how much change you can affect with a new design of schools. I think all of us need to be thinking about schools differently differently. Uh, the pandemic shone a light on problems that existed forever. And community schools were always paying attention to the wraparound, whole child centered approach in a way that many public schools didn't need to previously. And so, if this is the future, I'm here for that. Um, and I'm excited that both of you have come on today. As a final question before we wrap up, I would wonder for you what advice you would give. I'm tweaking my typical last question. What advice you would give a community school leader or partnership leader or coordinator who is starting their career for the first time in a community school? What would you tell them? Lita, I'll start with you. I think I would tell them to listen, you know, to listen to our students, to listen to our families, to listen to our community, to be patient. And just to be open to really thinking creatively about how to work collaboratively to address, you know, both the challenges that we face, but also the assets that we have and how we can, how we can utilize all of those things to improve outcomes for all kids and families and for our community. Mr. Torres, how about you? Same question. What advice would you give a community school leader just beginning their, their journey in community school leadership? Pick up my book. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. um, reality, reality is be willing to be an equity warrior and not be afraid of this work. There's a lot of people out there that would hope that we don't do this work, <laughs> that we would stay quiet, that we would not be the squeaky wheel, that we would not be begging and hustling for resources. There are people that wish that we would just, you know, stay quiet and and allow these inequities to exist. And I say to to the people doing this work, especially new principals, don't be afraid. Because if you're doing everything for children and families, there's nothing you can do that's wrong. So just don't be afraid. You got to push through. Sometimes you're going to feel like you're swimming in the ocean. You catch your breath and then just hit the next wave and just keep moving forward. Because at the end of the day, it's not about you or me. It's about the children. And when we leave this earth, we want to leave this planet better than when we got here. That's, I like That is, yep, a perfect way to wrap up this conversation. Lita, Mr. Torres, thank you both so much for sharing your expertise, your experience, your wisdom, all on community schools. I... I'm on a little bit of a journey right now. I don't know if you can tell that I've become really obsessed with this idea of how schools can be better and you are doing the work. And so thank you for doing the work on behalf of the students that you serve. And thank you for sharing that work with all of the listeners of our podcast. Well, thank you for for, um, shining a light on, you know, educational issues and and ways that we can all work together. I want to thank you, Mr. Torres. This was really fun and really interesting and really (laughs) um, just really, you improve the quality of my day, both of you. Thank you. Same to you. And you keep hustling out there. You know, don't let the people in Rochester, you know, keep you from getting those resources. You keep doing the work. (laughs) And, you know, maybe one day I'll come out there and, and we'll, we'll, well I, was, I was just thinking the same thing. I was actually thinking I got, I've got to, my kids are old enough now. I think I could leave, come to New York, check, check you guys out. I'd love to go on a tour of your. Of, that would be school. great. 
Sounds like a date. I'll be, I'll just jaunt over a bridge and be there too. (laughs) I'm always up for a visit. Mr. Torres knows when I came last month, there were a lot of tears shed walking through the hallways of the first place I've ever worked and seeing all the growth in the community. So everybody here, you heard it here first. Lita and I are heading back to CS55 for a visit in the South Bronx coming soon. Yes. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to the Learning Can't Wait podcast. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, and share this episode. Be the first to know when we have a new episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or have a suggestion for an episode, email us at podcast at itutor.com. Grow your teaching staff with just one click. iTutor partners with state licensed teachers from across the U.S. to help schools provide additional instruction to students. Whether you need them part-time or full-time, our educators are standing by to get you started right away. Head to iTutor.com to learn more.